Hello and welcome to the EuroWhat, episode number 69 for the week of December 23rd, 2019. I'm Ben Smith, and this time around, it's just going to be me. Mike will be back next week as we finish up the year with a, a fun discussion. But something came out of that discussion that felt very much like its own episode, so I've cut this together myself. Okay, let's kill the intro. First off, happy holidays. I am currently off celebrating, having pre-taped this a few weeks ago, and what that means largely is that we're not going to have a news desk or discussion of any selections that may have happened between my taping this and this episode going out live. Instead, you're just going to have to listen to my voice as I talk through some ideas I had about Eurovision at the end of a decade. The best way it seemed to do one of these was to just get my Karina Longworth on and essentially record an audio essay. Hey computer, can we get the backing music playing? Much better. I'm a fan of Chris Melanfi's podcast, Hit Parade for Slate. Uh, And that show, if you're not familiar, takes specific moments in chart history and kind of dissects them and finds interesting stories within them. This time of year, he's got an episode all about UK Christmas number ones that's particularly great to listen to. And one of his most recent episodes looked at the music of the 2010s, dissecting the various trends, thinking about the decade that was. And it also introduced a model for thinking about a decade's music that I really liked. Rather than defining a decade by one sound, for instance, thinking of the 70s as the decade of disco, it's more useful to find multiple trends and an inflection point to help show change over time. For my 70s example, that means thinking as much about Looking Glass's Brandy as that sample of Gloria Gaynor I played earlier. I thought that might be a helpful model to look at the past decade's worth of Eurovision entries, uh, just to see if any interesting patterns emerge, or how things are changing there. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. In attempting to look at Eurovision as a whole in the last decade, I wanted to set a few parameters, given that I had a time limit. I wasn't going to use all 400 or so songs that were released, since that felt particularly daunting, and not everything made the final there. And even cutting it down to just the 260 or so that did make the finals also felt a little imposing. Similarly, cutting it down to just the 10 songs that won over the past decade felt a little limiting. It's hard to connect dots when there are only 10 of them. So the compromise I made was taking a look at the top five entries from each year. That gave me about 50 songs or so to work with, and that felt like a much better place to start looking at patterns and projecting some ideas. Before I dive into what I found in that data, please indulge one more random tangent about snacks that I promise has relevance to the decades worth of Eurovision songs I'm about to discuss. I really like snacks that have a balance of salty and sweet. Don't worry, this is not about to become a promo for Naturebox, we do not have a promo code, we are not sponsored by them yet. I just like snacks. Anyways, I tend to think about Eurovision in the same way. Good Eurovision songs, or at least the ones I think are good and like from year over year, tend to have a similar sweet and salty balance, though it's one between pop music and folk music. Looking at what did well at the contest over the course of this decade, it feels like there's been a rebalancing of salty versus sweet. Pop was dominant in the first half of the decade, Uh, then there was a swing back to more of the folk side of things, and now we're starting to see pop come back into play. Let's dive into that, and let's start right after the 2009 contest. Fairy Tale is the perfect place to start talking about Eurovision in the 2010s, because it's very emblematic of what winners sounded like in the early part of the decade. Alexander Ryback's song was a then record breaker finishing the contest with 387 points, a total that wouldn't be beat for a while. It's also a great example of what was winning at the start of the decade. It's mostly a pop song with just a little bit of of a folk flourish on top in the fiddle line that runs throughout. Listening back, it kind of feels like the Epcot version of Norway. That same template of pop with just a little bit of a flourish on top representative of that nation's folk music heritage tracks for a lot of what was placing in the top five. 
If you look at Turkey's entries from around the same time, Adisa's Doom Tech Tech, and Manga's We Could Be the Same, it's that same general template. A pop song with a little bit of Arabic flair in the backing track. Uh, that's also true for what Russia was sending. Their 2012 entry with the Russian grannies is essentially the club mix of a folk song. Party for everybody dance. Come on and, dance. and this pattern works well all the way until 2013, where Emily DeForest, only Teardrops, takes the crown for Denmark. That's not to say it's the only thing that's working, though. Power ballads also had a long history at the contest and were still doing well in the early 2010s. Iceland got their highest placement right behind Fairy Tale with Johanna's Is It True? Which, it's still a very effective song. I totally earwormed myself with this as I worked on the episode. And then another prime example of this from the early 2010s is Denmark's entry from that period, uh, Shanae and Nevergreen's In a Moment Like This. This is peak cheesy Eurovision duet, and they place fourth of it. Not bad. Uh, and again, it's a total earworm. So songs like these, with flourishes of the cultures they come from, are doing well. But what's ultimately winning the contest is the, their pop backbones, not the little folk flourishes. Uh, if you look at what's winning, uh, We Could Be The Same lost to Lena's Satellite. is just pure pop. And in 2012, Lorene's Euphoria set a standard that's been winning the Eurovision 250 year after year for good reason. It's got that nice little trancy bit. Uh, the performance essentially transformed the arena. I don't know, it's, it's got a lot going for it, even if it hasn't aged as well as some of the other winners. Satellite and Euphoria have aged relatively well, but one of the downsides to going pure pop is that what sounds fresh in 2009, 2010, or 2011 doesn't always hold up by the time you get to 2019. If you listen to other songs from the same period, uh, Ovi and Paula Selig's Playing With Fire, or Saki Srubis's This Is Our Night, This Is Our Night, both feel more dated from at least a 2019 perspective. If I wanted to be generous, I'd say that there's a certain maximalist quality, a certain throw everything at the wall in hopes it sticks-ness that just feels cluttered or, or muddy in retrospect. One final trend that was running the show in the first part of the decade was the Azerbaijani pop machine. After joining the contest in 2008, they quickly made a run for the crown with a strong string of songs that felt kind of lab-grown in their approach. Like, it felt very much like we have picked these two artists, and we have this song, and it's magically working now. If you look at what was doing well for Azerbaijan at this time, it's a culmination of a lot of what we've been, what we've been talking about. Barash and Izel's Always plays on standard pop structures with a little bit of a folk flourish. Sephira's Drip Drop from 2010 is Power Ballad City. And their 2011 entry, Ellen Nicky's Running Scared, 
finally figured out the, the secret sauce to earn them the win. I'm running out scared. If I'm honest, this isn't my favorite Azerbaijani entry, and it certainly wasn't my pick for the 2011 winner. But on the other hand, I'm often wrong about what the winner will be, and this does feel like a good acknowledgement of solid pop craftsmanship work over the past few years. Azerbaijan's string of winners continued into 2013, where, yes, Emily DeForest won, but Fareed Mamadov's Hold Me came a very close second. Okay, so to bring it back to my metaphor about sweet and salty from the top of the show, pop has been the dominating flavor at Eurovision in the first part of the decade, so when do things start tipping back towards folk music salt? Ultimately, I think that change happens at the 2014 contest, and there's an inflection point there, but there's definitely something that starts tipping the scales in that direction in 2011, Italy returning to the contest. Italy's return to the contest after a 14-year break in 2011, and their specific use of the San Remo Festival as their source for entrance, seems to have had an effect on the quality of the acts everyone was sending to the contest. In 2011, their re-debut, Rafael Gualazzi's Madness of Love, shot to second place, a welcome return. And their 2013 entry, Marco Mangoni's L'Essenziale, placed just outside the top five a few years later. Both of these entries have a timeless quality to them that doesn't feel specifically connected to the Eurovision contest as a whole as some of the other entries I've played have. Their entry from 2015, El Volo's Grande Amore, also did very well and fits in nicely with a lot of what was starting to take shape there as other, art, as other countries looked at what Italy was doing and made their own course corrections about what they were sending. Don't get it mistaken, Pop is still leading the charge in 2014. What ultimately ends up winning that year, Conchita Wurst's Rise Like a Phoenix, takes what Italy has been doing the, the past few years, turns it up to 11, and cranks out a lost Bond theme that brings home a victory for Austria. Looking right below it though, you have things like Sana Nielsen's Undo, And Aram MP3 is not alone. You're not alone. Giving it a run for its money. Both of these were in pre-contest discussion as potential winners, and all of them are on the pop side of things. None of these moments are quite the inflection point in 2014 that ultimately sends us towards a more folk-dominated contest. What does, though, is a nice tie into the 2020 contest, since it's the Dutch entry from that year. The common linnets calm after the storm. Calm after the storm feels a little ahead of its time as a Eurovision entry. I remember in 2014 writing how weird it felt to have what I thought of as a primarily American form of folk or country music reflected back at me by another country. But there's a, just something about this song that still resonates with me five years later. I still have it in my go-to playlists. This was a Eurovision song that felt more radio-ready and reflective of current music trends than the competition seemed to normally go. It also has that nice connection to 2019, since Duncan Lawrence, 2019's winner, was a protege of Ilsa DeLong, one of the common linnets, when she was a judge on The Voice. Songs that do well in one year at the contest tend to influence at least a handful of the hundreds of songs that make it to national finals and make it to the actual contest. Think about how Cyprus's 2018 entry, Eleni Ferreira's Fuego, me 
got cloned into Cypress's 2019 entry, Tomta's Replay. That's what you call me, that's what you call me. So you feel lonely early in the morning, early in the morning. Time is moving slowly. We keep it on to come. And also had an effect on Switzerland's entry from this year. Luca Hani, she got me. When she go low, when she go low, she go so low, she go so low. Oh, she know, oh, oh, she know, she got me dirty dancing, dirty dancing. It sometimes takes a few years for those trends to fully bubble up into winning, though, and that's definitely true of Calm After the Storm's influence. Don't tell the gods I left a mess, I can't undo what has been done. Let's run for cover. I think it's possible to argue that while still very pop, Manzel Merlot's Heroes takes some countryfied influence from Calm After the Storm. Pairing that with a very strong visual performance in the contest to take Sweden to its second win in three years in 2015. But the effects of Italy's strong selections and Calm After the Storm's idiosyncratic sound can be seen elsewhere in the selections other nations were making that year. Australia made their official debut with a very strong Tonight Again. Belgium turned their selection internal and kicked off a new era of strong selections with Loic Natet's Rhythm Inside. And Latvia's Amanata presented Love Injected, which feels like a slightly more pop-sided version of what FKA Twigs was doing with alt R&B elsewhere on the charts at the same time. Starting in 2016, what wins the contest is now much more folk and artist-driven, with pop still present, but more of a secondary concern. Dami Im's Sound of Silence, and Sergei Lazarev's You Are My Only One, are each strong pop contenders, but what ends up winning the contest is Jamala's 1944. With a combo of vocal prowess, strong storytelling, and a folk backbone on pop beats. The next year, Salvador Sobral's Amor Pelos Deutsch picked up this torch and ran with it in a way that I could not see succeeding at the time. There's still a spreadsheet somewhere in Eurowhat HQ where I've noted that the song is beautiful but seems likely to be curb stomped by the other strong entries that year. I was so wrong. It'd be easy to take what was going on in 2016 and 2017 and form an argument that quote unquote real music was winning the battle over quote unquote plastic pop, particularly if you were listening to Salvador Sobral's press conferences after winning the contest in 2017. But I don't think the narrative is that easy. Pop was still doing well, but was learning year over year from what did well and going to more interesting places, both in its subject matter and its instrumentation. Poli Genoa's entry for Bulgaria's return to the contest in 2016, If Love Was a Crime, indirectly speaks to same-sex relationships while having some great modern beats behind it, and some very on-trend vocal sampling in the instrumentation. And Moldova rose to third place in 2017, their highest score ever, by blending traditional Mold Moldovan folk instrumentation with modern beats and a striking visual presentation.
One of the more interesting data points in the second half of the decade has been seeing the previous pop powerhouses of the first half of the decade, Azerbaijan and Sweden, see their dominance at the top part of the scoreboard start to sink. After winning in 2011 and placing second in 2013, Azerbaijan's previously unbroken record of placing in the top five this decade slipped up, placing 22nd in 2014 with Dilara Kazamova's Start of Fire, not making the final at all in 2018 with Izel's Cross My Heart, and generally placing outside the top 10 in the final consistently until 2019, where Chingis's Truth finished in 8th. Sweden's been seeing a similar lack of love for their pop prowess, though it's been harder to notice just when looking at final scores. Robin Bengtsson's I Can't Go On, Benjamin and Grossa's Dance You Off, and John Lundvik's Too Late for Love. have all placed in the top 10 of their respective years, but it's been largely with jury points. Splitting the distribution of the vote into separately announced tallies has meant it's easier to see that while juries love what Sweden is doing, the home audience seems to have cooled on their standard pop structures, finding other acts more appealing. After heading strongly towards the folk influence side of things, it feels like pop is starting to be the flavor most audiences want again. Recent winners, Toy by Netta, and Duncan Lawrence's Arcade. Both feel more aligned with this but I'd argue that it's still a more interesting pop, especially as you look at what's nipped at those entries' heels. Italy is still leading the way on this. Non mi avete fatto niente had a stronger showing than I expected it to in 2018, finishing top five, and tackled a tough subject head on. And Soldi, from this year, told a similar strong story. They beat you couldn't help clapping along with. It wouldn't surprise me if Italy's strong near decades worth of performances finally takes the trophy in 2020 or 2021. All in all, I like the place the competition's gone in the last decade. I love some good schlager pop, but what's happening right now is nations choose their artists, whether closer to Duncan, Netta, or Hatari. are things that reflect a wider band of musical ideas that constitute pop. Hopefully the 2020s will keep up the trend, or if not, at least take us to another interesting place. Okay, start the outro? That's going to do it for this episode of the Euro What. Thanks for listening. This episode of the Euro What was hosted by me, Ben Smith, and I'm typically joined by my co-host, Mike McComb. The interstitial backing music that ran throughout this episode was Beauty Flow by Kevin McLeod and was used with a Creative Commons license. More on that in the show notes. You can find us on our website at eurowhat.com and on social media at eurowhat. I'd love to hear what trends of the 2010s were your favorite this decade in Eurovision. Definitely reach out to us there. You can subscribe to the Eurowhat on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. We'll be back next week to look at the Eurovision entries of the 2010s from a different angle and put 2019 to bed. See you there.